Children through second grade, y'all can meet Miss Joy and head off to Children's Church. And while they're heading out the door, if you have your Bible, or if you don't have one, there should be one in front of you somewhere, I hope. Turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11. Are you ready? Let her rip. That's right. Isaiah 11. Uh, we're going to try to cover 11 and 12 today. This will complete the study guide that y'all picked up, uh, the Advent study guide. And so this is the last lesson there. Uh, Isaiah 1 through 12 really form the introduction to the book of Isaiah. And I put a little uh, outline there in your notes that's in your bulletin. It's good to understand the first 12 chapters of Isaiah. If you struggle through the rest of the book of Isaiah, then trust me, you're not alone. <laughs> There's a lot of difficulties, in, particularly chapters 13 through 39 are just very difficult to interpret. 40 through 66 have some challenges, but there's so much comfort and joy in there that they're a little easier to get through. Uh, my plan, just to let you know, is I thought about going straight through Isaiah, but I have to confess I thought it would kill me if I did because 66 chapters and, like I said, the next 13 through 39 are really tough. They're not easy to sort through, and I can't even understand half of it. So I'm still trying to learn and interpret as best as I can. So what we're going to do is after this week, we're going to spend two weeks summarizing the overall themes of Isaiah 13 through 39. Then Isaiah has a little natural break at chapter 39, and I'm going to take a natural break there, and we're going to do a 12-week series through the major doctrines of Christianity. I feel like with 2020... We need to see clearly what we believe. And in today's culture where uh, people don't know what they believe and they just accept everything that's just sort of passed down to them, we're going to be looking at the doctrine of the Bible and the doctrine of God and the doctrine of Christ and the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of salvation and the church and the Holy Spirit um, and the end times. So we'll take some time looking at those. And so we're going to move through that. I'm also going to give you a study guide because I think that's important for you to be uh, going into God's Word uh, during the week. And so that's the, that's the game plan. So next week I'm going to try to summarize 13 through 35. So woohoo! So we're canceling all other services and we're just going to have one. No, we'll try our best. But if nothing else, get your mind around Isaiah 1 through 12 because it really is a self-contained unit. Chapters 1 through 5, God gives his diagnosis of Judah. Isaiah sent to Judah. He gives his diagnosis of Judah. And what is their diagnosis? This is a nation that has forsaken God. They've rebelled against God. They've rejected God's future for them. Uh, they refuse to uh, accept his grace. He's done everything he could possibly do as a vineyard keeper, and they've rejected that grace. It looks like a hopeless situation. In fact, chapter 5 ends with darkness. And then Isaiah 6 comes on the scene. I would say Isaiah 6 is one of the key chapters, if not the key chapter in the whole book. Because you see the holiness of God. He is proclaimed as holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah, in seeing the holiness of God, what does he see? He sees his utter, helpless sinfulness. And he says, woe is on me, meaning I am unraveled. I have no excuse before the holy and righteous God. And it looks like he has absolutely no hope. And then out of sheer grace, uninitiated, um, undeserved grace... God sends forth an angel with a coal from an altar, some kind of altar that must have blood on it that has eternal value because when that coal touches Isaiah's lips, he says, your sins are forgiven. They're clean. They're gone. And Isaiah, a man who just saw the holiness of God, now has experienced grace at a level he cannot fathom. And so he says, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm going to do because grace has so changed him. Isaiah's testimony in Isaiah 6 becomes the model for every believer who is confronted with what's going on in the world, confronted with the holiness of God, and he becomes a testimony to that whole book that God, even though he is holy, has provided some means of forgiveness through his grace. Chapter 7 and 8, what do we have? Uh, King Ahaz is threatened by Assyria. King Ahaz is important because he sits on the Davidic throne. The Davidic throne is to be the throne based on the Davidic covenant that a king is supposed to come. He's supposed to be one faithful to God, but was Ahaz faithful to God? Absolutely not. Fearful, made alliances with the very nations that were going to devour him. And so what you have in those chapters is the failure of the Davidic king with a promise of a true Davidic king. 
This Davidic kingship has failed, but there's a promise of a new Davidic king, which ends with Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. This king is going to be a child who's born, who's going to be a son of David, whose name's going to be Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Everlasting Father. Again, this something's coming. Then in chapters 9 and 10, you have the failure of the nation of Israel, designed to be a blessing to the world. Instead, they're uh, divided with their own people. They are serving idols. They're putting their trust elsewhere. So you have the failure of the nation of Israel, who was called to be a blessing to the world. And then you have the promise of a remnant. Even though Israel has failed, God is going to preserve a remnant, and one day he will again use the nation of Israel. All of that then comes to this crescendo in chapter 11 where we've gotten these glimpses of the Messiah, and now we see Messiah and his kingdom, and chapter 12 ends with just a song of rejoicing. Because deep down, you know what you're longing for? You're longing for the kingdom. You may not know it, but what you are longing for, what I am longing for, is the kingdom. We are longing for the day when Jesus Christ reigns on this earth. Like what Randy Alcorn says, what God made us to desire and therefore what we do desire, if we admit it, is exactly what he promises to those who follow Jesus Christ, a resurrected life and a resurrected body with a resurrected Christ on a resurrected earth. Donald Bloch says this, Our greatest affliction is not anxiety or even guilt, but rather homesickness, a nostalgia or an eradicable yearning to be at home with God. You and I were created for Eden. And we don't live in Eden, have you noticed? <laughs> we live in a crazy jungle. Uh, I wanted to, uh, over Christmas they had all these commercials, and I'm a, I'm a commercial exegete. I don't know if you know what that is. <laughs> but I love watching commercials. Be, you know, sometimes people skip commercials. But you realize a commercial is a 30-second sermon because it identifies a need. They have done research to know what your needs are. They will identify a need which is usually a very legitimate human need, but then they offer a solution that is a reflection of our consumeristic culture that thinks that if you buy something, that's going to be the solution. So here's a 30-second commercial that uh, caught my attention because it ends with Joy to the World, which is really a song written for when the day Christ comes to reign. And I want you to tell me what the problem is and what the solution is. Let's see if this commercial comes up. Here we go. Experience the power of sanctuary at the Lincoln Wish List event. Receive a $1,500 winter bonus on most new 2019-2020 Lincoln vehicles. Now, don't go out and buy a Lincoln. That would totally... Not, if you're if planning on it, that's okay, but the winter bonus is gone, so don't, uh, uh, don't worry about that. What's the problem? What is the problem that this chaos she's facing? She comes home from probably from a hard day of work, she walks in, and there is utter chaos going on in her home. Disconnected. Uh, yeah, one's on the phone. One's got the dogs all messed up. The kids are swatting things at her. Now, of course, my first question is, where's Dad? Or <laughs> where's the babysitter? I mean, is Dad, like, upstairs watching a football game? I mean, this is like, forget the fact this is an example of bad parenting because she's going to leave, <laughs> leave them again in that kind of chaos. But... What's the solution offered to this, this world and life of chaos? Yeah. Notice that this car is the power of sanctuary. I mean, that's a, that's a religious term, that your car could be your sanctuary. And what does it offer you? Just quiet, peace, <laughs> recline. I mean, it's just this sense that when life is chaotic, what you need is just to leave your kids in the chaos, go outside in the garage, close the windows, and just sit in your little sanctuary and allow, I don't know, disconnect from the world. So the problem is chaos. The solution is the power of sanctuary sitting in the car. Do, we, do you ever feel like that lady, though? How do you feel today? You feel like life is chaotic? Feeling a little overwhelmed? Um, how many of you would say, at the deepest part of me, I just long for peace? <laughs> yeah, look, I got amen. I see those hands. That's good. Uh, 
I long for peace, contentment. Just that right now my mind sometimes feels like it's out of control. The world seems out of control. My relationships seem out of control. And I long for there to be shalom, just peace. And what God is promising in Isaiah 11 is peace. It's what he's promising. But you realize that peace within is not a a goal on its own. Some people are just looking for peace within. But that's not true peace. True peace, true shalom means peace with God. This relationship is right. Peace with others. My relationships with others is right. Peace in this world. Because this world's at war with you. Have you noticed? (laughs) Uh, There's wildfires in Australia. There's earthquakes in Turkey. There's this weird virus that's starting to impact China. This world does not like us, or it's in, it's in war against us. It's not under our submission, I can tell you that. So we need peace in this world, and we need peace within, and all of that goes together. If you try to have peace within without those other pieces, then eventually it's more of an escape. It's an illusion, not reality. So where does that peace come from? That peace comes from the reign of the Messiah Christ is coming to reign on this earth. Do you hear me? This messed up world that is looking for political solutions, that is watching Coke commercials and thinking that that's what's going to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony, that listens to John Lennon and his imagine this world. We have this longing for peace, but peace comes when the Prince of Peace reigns on this earth, and he is coming. That's why the prayer of the church is, even so, come Lord Jesus. That is your prayer. Like I said, when you pray for someone to be healed, when you pray that they do not pass away, when you pray for relationships to be restored, what you're praying for is, Lord Jesus, come. Come. Because here's what happens when he comes. Look at chapter 11. Let's read these verses together. We're going to read to verse 10. There shall come forth a rod from the stem or the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. Why? For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And I'm going to go ahead and read verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people for the Gentiles shall seek him and his resting place or the place of his rest shall be full of glory, glorious. Let me stop there and look at the reign of the Messiah. What do we know? First of all, let's look at the Messiah's character. Who is this Messiah? And remember, Isaiah is revealing glimpses slowly. We're not gotten to Isaiah 53 yet. We're just getting these glimpses of who Messiah is. What do we know about Messiah from these verses? One, he shall come forth from the stump of Jesse. Uh, You see his human ancestry. Uh, Who's Jesse? David's father. It's interesting. He doesn't say comes from the root or the stump of David. And many people think because he's saying uh, they had already had plenty of Davidic sons who had failed. Now we're going to have a new David. Because if you have one that's from the root or the shoot of Jesse, it's almost saying he's going to be another David, a new Davidic king. It's interesting, he's not only the shoot of Jesse, but look at verse 10. He's also the root of Jesse. And what does that tell you? Not only does he come from Jesse's line, he's the very creator of Jesse's line. He is a man who is actually the father of his great, 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 great grandfather. That's an impossibility. Any Jewish reader should think, this doesn't make a bit of sense. Same thing for a child in chapter 9 to be called everlasting father. It's creating this sense of a human ancestry. I like that concept of a shoot from the stump. When I went home to Florida, my dad cut down a tree in our front yard. I don't know when he cut it down, maybe a year or so ago. 
And I saw that picture, and it reminded me of what Isaiah 11 is saying, because what's going on? That tree's been cut down. Dad thought that was going to take care of the tree, and what's going on? Life is still there, and at some point, it's going to emerge. When did the Davidic kingship end? It ended in 586 with a guy named Zedekiah. And what Davidic king has ruled after him? None. It's gone. The Davidic kingship, for all intents and purposes, is like a cut-down tree that has no life in it. But at some point, it's going to spring to new life as there's going to be a new David, a son of Jesse, one who's also the root of Jesse who comes and rules. So he has human ancestry, but he has divine power. Because the next verse, verse 2, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of Yahweh. I love that word rest upon him. It's the idea of it. it's at, totally at home on him. It just empowers him, envelops him, permeates him. It just rests upon him. And I do think this is a picture of the sevenfold spirit. In Revelation, you oftentimes hear this picture of the seven spirits of God, and there's a lot of different interpretations. I lean towards interpretation that it's the sevenfold spirit, the spirit in all of his fullness, which you see here. He's the spirit of the Lord. He's the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. And all through the book of Isaiah, Messiah is pictured as one who is spirit-led, spirit-filled, spirit-permeated. In fact, uh, Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. That was the first passage that Jesus read when he went to the synagogue in Nazareth. And they ask him, Rabbi, why don't you speak? And that's what he read. Stopping mid-sentence because the next part says, and the day of the vengeance of the Lord, because I think, well, he knew that that was coming later. But now is a time of proclamation of good news to the weak. What's interesting is he spoke it at the synagogue in Nazareth. The word Nazareth, we believe, comes from the Hebrew word Natsar, which is the word branch. So if you want to know why he's called the Nazarene or he's from Nazareth, part of it is because that meaning is the branch. And what's he called in the Old Testament? He's called the branch of the Lord. And so it's interesting that he is from the place called the branch. And he spoke this in their synagogue. So that's his character. What are his actions? Well, first of all, you see he has true worship. Verse 3, his delight is in the fear of the Lord. I love that picture because it's, his smell of delight. The word delight's actually the word of smell. And it means, have you ever smelled something that made you light up with a smile? Have you ever come home when you're really hungry and your wife is making chocolate chip cookies or cinnamon rolls uh, and it starts to smell and you walk in and immediately you just have this sense of delight? Smell can, can create a delight that sometimes no other uh, faculty can. And this is the picture that he delights. He just just breathes in God's worship. He loves, he delights in everything that God does. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. How do judges today decide cases? By the sight of their eyes and by the hearing of their ears, don't they? They have to see evidence and hear witnesses. That's the only way judges can judge. But what's the limitation to that kind of justice? Sometimes you don't see things accurately, and sometimes people lie and don't give you the whole story. So a true justice has to have true, absolute knowledge. The reason we can't have true justice in our world is because we don't know everything. And people can fool us. People can say things. There are things that can trick our eyes. And on top of that, we don't know the motives of the heart. But this is saying when this judge comes, he doesn't have to judge by what he sees and what he hears because he pierces down and actually sees the heart motive and knows exactly why everyone did what they did. And that's why there's justice. And he judges the poor and he brings equity for the meek of the earth, strikes the earth, removes those who are wicked, the ungodly, and the prideful. And his whole rule is characterized by righteousness and faithfulness. That becomes the very nature of his rule. And because of his character and because of his actions, what do we have? We have this kingdom of peace. How many of y'all like verses 6 through 9? Anybody? How many of you try to talk to your animals? 
And you just want to have peace with them. And you, how many of y'all would like to go down to Mike the Tiger and just play with Mike the Tiger inside his cage, you know, and, and pull rope with him and, you know, ride him a little bit? Think about There is something inside the human psyche that wants to have peace and relationship with the animal world. I mean, think of every Disney movie. It's all about animals that talk and animals that you can be friendly with, and they're all nice and wonderful. And I love the picture that he describes here because I think it's a human longing that was back then, 2,700 years ago, still resonates with us today. And just look at how he describes. I'll just call out a few things to observe. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. Interesting. Underline that word dwell because it's the word sojourn. It's the Hebrew word ger, which generally is used for a foreigner. It's interesting. It's not that the lamb is the foreigner in the wolf's land. The wolf is the foreigner in the lamb's land. And it's the lamb that's inviting the wolf to live with him. Uh, It's the land of the meek, the land of the weak, those who are dependent upon God and the lamb. Of course, the lamb is going to rule. And the wolf shall sojourn with the lamb. The leopard lies down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion, the fatling together. A little child shall lead them. Uh, Even the the smallest can lead the most fiercest of animals with absolutely no fear. The cow and the bear shall graze together. Their young ones shall lie down. Underline their young ones, because what is that saying? It's not only one generation of animals that are experiencing this peace, but it is passed on. Everything has changed. So even the new animals that are being born have the same kind of disposition and mentality. And then the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And I know many biologists say, well, that's impossible. They would die. Their digestive system is not able to handle that. Because God's going to change them. The one that can change an ugly-looking caterpillar and dissolve its total insides and make it into a butterfly can certainly handle dealing with the digestive system of a lion to change it from being a carnivore to an herbivore. In fact, I think that's what the condition was in Genesis 1 and 2 before Genesis 3. And so now the lion is is over there eating grass, uh, over there with the ox. And then the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole. Any parents here, you just like your kids playing, you all like to get like rattlesnakes and give them to your kids, say go go play with them. Uh, Wean child or the toddler shall put his hand in the viper's den. If you're the parent of a toddler, Your whole life now revolves around protecting your toddler from every danger that now exists in the world, don't you? If you get a toddler, what's the first thing you do in your house? You go through all the house. You find your uh, electrical cords, and what do you do? You buy those little plugs, and you put all those in the plugs. Because you know what toddlers will do? They'll find a fork, and they'll stick it in there to see what's going to happen. You put cabinet locks on all of your cabinets to make sure they don't do that. Uh, You put safety gates so they don't go wandering off somewhere else. Your, Your job as a parent is to protect them from all the dangers in this world because as a parent, you know this world is dangerous. And a toddler doesn't know that yet. But as you get older, you suddenly realize this world is dangerous. Um, I put a quote in here by a a psychology professor at Harvard. Um, He said, being able to feel safe with other people, and I would say feeling safe in the world in general, is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. In other words, if we do not feel safe, it impacts us on all kinds of levels. Um, If a child is in a home that is in chaotic, dangerous mess, it has traumatic effect on that child. Um, If you're in a relationship that does not feel safe, you know it just dominates almost everything you do. So think about it. What hinders us and what prevents us from truly having peace in our relationships, peace in our hearts, is we live in a dangerous world. How many of you have wounds and scars? Not just physical ones, but emotional ones. And what happens, we know that little toddler thinks the world is safe, and so we have to protect them. But when that toddler becomes a 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old, 50-year-old, and has been rejected, and has been betrayed, and has been hurt, uh, and has been lied to, you know what they begin to realize? This world is a dangerous, dangerous world. 
And so deep down, what we're longing for is the day when shalom reigns. That even a child, you could just let him loose at the Baton Rouge Zoo with no bars and just let him play with whatever he plays with. And that is the longing that we have. Uh, I love what uh, Sharon sent me. She sent me a picture of Hannah, her granddaughter, playing with leopards because apparently that's Hannah's greatest desire. When uh, Is that true, Hannah? Cheetahs. Cheetahs. Okay, I don't know the difference between a cheetah and a leopard. but Okay, one of them runs fast. There you go. So if you're being chased by one, the leopard's a better one to be chased by. There you go. Okay. Um, why is this all going to happen? Here's the key point. We all think it's going to happen because of politics, because someone's going to figure it out, because we're going to solve uh, global warming, because we're going to solve diseases. That's not why it's going to happen. Peace comes because the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And I love that word. That word knowledge is not a noun. It's a verbal noun, meaning it's not just cognitive stuff. The earth is going to be filled with the active knowing of the Lord active relationship with the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's the prayer in the Psalms. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Um, And then where does that come from? You see that in the new covenant promise given to the nation of Israel, which we have been grafted into as Gentiles. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. Why? For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I'll remember no more. Why do we not have relationship with the Lord? Because of our sin. Christ and his new covenant has uh, atoned for that sin, bore the wrath of God so that we could have relationship with God. But even now, that relationship is like looking in a mirror dimly, but one day we shall know know him even as we are known. We shall see him face to face. And when you see your Savior face to face, it's almost like every doubt, every confusion, everything that didn't make a bit of sense about your life, as soon as you see his face, it's like suddenly everything is going to make sense. Because now you'll understand who you are and who you're created to be. And Revelation is going to give you a name that only you know because whatever that name is, it's going to resonate in the depths of your soul. And you're going to finally know who you are because you're going to know him. That's when peace, shalom, reigns on the earth. So that's the picture of the world at perfect peace. It's the earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord. But it doesn't end there. Let's keep reading. Verse 11, what's going to go along with this? And it shall come to pass in that day. So we have that tie to chapter 10, I mean chapter, verse 10. It shall come to pass in that day the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, that's the original name for Babylon, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Also the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. But they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt. With his mighty wind he will shake his fist over the river and strike it in the seven streams and make men cross over dry shod. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria as it was for Israel in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. Did you catch all that? What it's tying together is that the reign of the Messiah is tied to another key historical redemptive event, and that is the regathering of Israel. Those two go together in God's divine plan. Why? Because God is going to keep his promises to Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. That is a false doctrine. God is going to keep those promises, the Abrahamic covenant and the Palestinian covenant and the Davidic covenant and the new covenant. He is going to keep his promises to Israel. If you don't believe me, read the end of Romans 11, and Paul makes it very clear that he still has a plan for Israel. That's why he's been preserving a remnant from the days of Isaiah all the way to today. And so he's going to lift his hand a second time. Now, uh, that's what it says in verse 11. I think the second time is he br- did bring them back from Babylonian captivity, but that was a limited regathering because it was only the tribe of Judah 
and Benjamin. It was not the northern ten tribes. It did not last long because they were scattered again. But in this gathering, he's going to bring them from all four corners of the world and not just the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, but the other tribes that we say are lost will be regathered there in the land of Israel. Do you realize that we're living in some pretty unique times? Israel as a nation was totally wiped out in A.D. 70. It's almost unheard of that any nation that was totally wiped out could maintain themselves, their culture, their uh, ancestry, and come back 1,900 years later and form a nation. That's a miracle. (laughs) That does not happen every day. May 14, 1948, something unique happened in the history of the world. Israel was regathered as a nation. Um, So I don't know if you can see this or not, but Israel, I think it started off with like 500,000 Jews in the Holy Land at that time. Now there's over 6 million. For the first time, there are more Jews in Israel than there are in the United States. For the longest time, the United States had the most concentration of Jews. Now Israel does. Between the United States and Israel, 83% live in Israel, that little, little nation surrounded by nations that would love to destroy it if they had the opportunity. About 46% of the worldwide Jewish population lives in Israel now. And where are they all? Oh, uh, this article just recently, just a few weeks ago, 255,000 from 150 nations moved to Israel 2010 to 2019. It's the most the largest amount of immigration that they've had in this past decade. It's called uh, Aliyah, uh, going up. I know Mitch Glazer talked about it a few weeks ago. And that's what's happening. And look at where they're coming from. Coming from all over the world. God said that he was going to regather the nation from the four corners of the world. And where are they coming from? The four corners of the world. Uh, Russia, the Middle East, Africa, Europe from the Western Hemisphere. Isn't that awesome? (laughs) Uh, There is something going on. I think we're living in the days where God is fulfilling his promise of regathering Israel, and they are being regathered in the land even now. I was going to show a little video um, of what's going on. I'll go ahead and show it. We'll do it. The Israel I came back to was not the Israel I left. I was amazed at what happened here during the 14 years I was away. Israel had transformed. Israel had not only joined the 21st century, in many ways it was now leading the way. When you look at the NASDAQ, companies are listed from around the world. There's one country though that truly stands out and that is Israel. And Israel is the fastest growing, one of the most dynamic entrepreneurial and innovation based economies on the planet. The sky is the limit for inventors in Israel. Israel has been a remarkable achiever in terms of technological innovation. Israel has developed some of um, the world's leading technology. Even if you don't live in Israel, chances are you have something that was made here. If you just look at it on a, on a daily basis, how much stuff you use in your daily life that has its origins in Israel, it's, it's rather remarkable. Many of uh, the microprocessors invented by Intel were designed in Israel. Nowhere in the world outside of Silicon Valley will you find more technology startups. People come from all over the world to look for Israeli technology. Warren Buffett shelled out more than $4 billion for Iskar Metalworking, the largest purchase that legendary investor has made outside the United States. I, I understand that their facilities are incredible, but I would expect that. Intel developed here, HP has a center here, Google is very successful here, Microsoft as well as the research and development. If you actually do the math, Microsoft is almost as much an Israeli company as we are a U.S. company. This country has been such a beta site or a laboratory for solving uh, both national and international problems since its inception. The technology coming out of Israel is being used to connect the world, green the planet, save lives, and have fun. Wow. Wow. For instance, Kinex lets me use my body as the controller. This very cool technology was developed in Israel and then bought by Microsoft. In a way, Israel is known to 
everybody as a center of innovation, as a place where you can find more innovation than anywhere else in the world per capita. If you look at countries that are represented in the stock exchange, the ranking today is number one, of course, the United States. Number two is China. And number three is Israel. The U.S., China, Israel. Looking at our size, how is it that Israel, with its seven million people, has the third largest group of companies traded in New York? This is an amazing fact for a tiny country to actually eclipse all the nations of Europe in the creativity of its entrepreneurial leadership. I thought that was an interesting video because sometimes we know Israel's a nation innovation that's coming out of that nation and how and again I don't think they're in the land yet as believers but they are in the land and God has designed that nation to be a blessing to the nations of the world the families of the world and what's they're developing is amazing Mark Twain said this if statistics are right the Jews constitute but one percent of the human race yet his contributions to the world's list of great names in literature science art music finance medicine and learning are way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in this world in all the ages and had done it with his hands tied behind his back. He could be vain of himself and be excused for it. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Persian rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise, and they're gone. Other people have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out, and they sit in twilight now or have vanished. The Jews saw them all, beat them all. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? And I could answer Mark Twain. <laughs> it's the faithful promise of God, his covenant in Genesis 12. They were designed to be a blessing to the nations, and God is going to fulfill his promise to them. Uh, at the same time, anti-Semiticism is growing in the world. The reports are saying it's growing. What's interesting is anti-Semitism grows. It's causing more and more Jews to migrate into the Jewish homeland, which, again, is almost a reverse thing of what you saw where they were spread out because of persecution. Now persecution may be the very thing God uses to bring them back together. So where are we at on the, on the story of history? Well, this is my understanding. You're part of a story, and where's that story headed? It's heading to the day that Christ returns and reigns on this earth. We live between the first and second comings of Jesus, the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, the coming king in Isaiah 11, and we live in that in-between time where the, the doors of the kingdom have been wide open because of the blood of the Lamb. I think at some point God's going to regather and work through the nation of Israel. Because of that, I think the church is going to be raptured because God is going to go back and fulfill his promises and use the nation of Israel. And this last day, we are, you're going to see throughout Isaiah, we've seen this phrase, in that day, in that day, in that day. This is the day of the Lord. How does a Jewish day begin? In the evening or in the morning? In the evening. And so the Jewish day of the Lord begins with a time of darkness, tribulation, a time of chaos on this earth. But in the midst of that, Jesus Christ returns, and then you have the kingdom of the brightness of the noonday sun. And that is what all of history is moving towards. When you bowed your knee to Jesus Christ, you became a citizen of the kingdom. If you know Jesus Christ, you're a kingdom citizen, which means what? You're living in a different kind of way. This is not your home. You are now a citizen of the kingdom of God, and your hope is tied to the day when your king reigns on this earth. Therefore, you should live differently. You don't say, well, everybody else is doing this. That makes absolutely no difference. The question is, am I honoring my king who I bow to? Because that is where history is moving. If I'm living for a kingdom today, it's going to be one that fades I live for the eternal one that is coming and the one, only, only one that has hope for what this world desperately needs. If you don't know Christ, he is the one who defeated sin and death and Satan. And you need to bow your knee and acknowledge, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I can't save myself. Thank you that you died on the cross for me. I embrace you. I believe in you. I trust in you as my Savior and Lord. And if you make that de declaration, 
then you are immediately transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And when that happens, you know what you should do? You should start rejoicing. Let's read uh, chapter 12. Let's just read it, and then we're going to sing some songs. So I don't know if uh, our musicians can come up, because we're going to end. We'll look maybe a little bit more at chapter 12 next week, but here's what you should do. If you know Jesus Christ as Savior, how does a kingdom citizen live? In that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. God's wrath has been propitiated because of this sacrifice of the Son. And now you say this, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. This is what I call the individual testimony of grace because this is written in the singular. How do you know if you've trusted Christ? You should be able to say, Jesus is my strength, my song, and my salvation. Not that Jesus is the song and he is the salvation and that he is the Savior. He is my Savior. He is my salvation. He is my strength. He is my song. That is that personal testimony. And I love Rachel showing drawing water, drawing joy from the wells of salvation, allowing him to fill you through his spirit. But it doesn't end there. Because the individual testimony of grace leads to a corporate testimony of grace. Notice in verse 4, in that day you, the correct southern translation, in that day all of y'all will say. That's the limits of English that would be corrected if people simply listened to the southern culture because we figured it out. It doesn't say in that day you guys, that would be offensive. <laughs> that would not make a bit of sense. But in that day, all of y'all will say, you know what you're called to do as a believer? You're called to be a witness of the kingdom. You're called to proclaim. Um, we're now a, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. Uh, his own special people called out of darkness into his marvelous light that we can proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. So what do we do? Praise the Lord. Call upon his name. Declare his deeds among the peoples. Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he's done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout. And if you look at the Hebrew word for shout, you know what it means? It means shout. It means every once in a while you can let loose a little bit and shout. O oh, inhabitant of Zion, because you are an inhabitant of Zion, you are a kingdom citizen, and great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. You realize that the Holy One of Israel the one in absolute purity, there is no way he could dwell in our midst because we are not worthy. We are unholy unless there has been a sacrifice made that has cleansed us. And now we are in Christ, forgiven. And you are in the Messiah. And because of that, the Holy One now dwells in your midst. I know this world is crazy and messed up. Just remember, this is not my home. My citizenship is elsewhere. I'm an ambassador here to proclaim the praises of the coming king and his kingdom, and I'm going to live in a way that exalts him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for the hope we have in Christ. In the midst of our discouragement and anxieties and depression and conflicts, Father, remind us that we have a hope, a true hope, a, trope that, a hope that's not pie in the sky. It is life on this earth. And if someone doesn't have that hope, I pray right now they would trust in you, embrace you as their Savior, declare you as their Savior, and then confess with their mouth as a confirmation of what they believe in their heart. Father, fill us with joy. We get so discouraged and overwhelmed by this world. Keep our eyes on you, and may we just rejoice in the hope that we have in Christ. And even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Amen.